All right, hello, uh, Dina. It's uh, wonderful to be with you. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us as part of the Humanities Beyond Bars Oral History Project. Um, and so, Dina, I know you are a CSUB student currently, uh, majoring in sociology, minoring in psychology with future plans to explore a master's degree in social work. So um, thanks again for, for being with us. It's, it's, it's really appreciated that you'll share your story as part of this collection. My pleasure. So, Dina, just to start, um, maybe we can start from the beginning. Um, where, did you, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Northern California in Sacramento, um, kind of a suburb, uh, Carmichael area uh, with my parents. Uh, my parents were both addicts. My dad was a Vietnam veteran, so he was dealing with some PTSD and my mother was, um, uh, she was special, <laughs> but uh, um, basically like, you know, moved around several times until I wound up here in Bakersfield my uh, sophomore or my seat was it freshman year of high school. And so tell me a bit about your childhood like when you think back to I mean, obviously childhood is an immense period of life right there's a lot that happens you can't capture it all in a, a sound bite but um, when you think back to your childhood I mean, what what jumps out at you as kind of distinctive about your childhood experience how do you describe it to yourself survival mode um pure survival mode like i did not realize until i think i was about 16 years old that how i grew up wasn't normal you know because that was my, basically my only perspective i didn't know that, that that wasn't something that everybody experienced and i think it was at that time when i figured that out that i really started to struggle with why me Mm -hmm. So a lot of, um, you know, and I've always been really, really smart, very intelligent, um, getting good grades, but I moved around from so many different schools that I never really got to see any of the fruits of that mm -hmm. until um, I think maybe high school. And even then I still struggled. So I was never really given a strong foundation um, for me to, to uh, apply myself academically. So it was just basically, you know, being pulled in every which direction that, you know, between my parents struggling with each other, uh, moving from town to town, place to place, that I was never given a foundation for me to even focus um, on my academics until and I was so, an adult, you know? Gotcha. Yeah, right. So it's just like you were, you felt you, you know, pulled in lots of different directions and, and moving around a lot was kind of distinctive of your, your childhood experience. Mm-hmm. And when you were a child, do you, do you think, were you reflective about that at the time? I mean, you mentioned you didn't really realize, so you were like a teenager. Wow, maybe this isn't normal, whatever that means, right? But, you know, as a child, did you just think, well, this is, this is what is normal for everybody? Looking back on it now, it was like, there were so many things about me, like fundamentally that were, um, I would say, stunted. Because, yeah. you know, it's, you know, you, you, develop at certain stages after you know you get to one and then you go to the, the next like I was never able to totally thrive in any of the environments because I was never given the stability you know and as soon as I found stability and was able to you know uh, establish some sort of uh, so social circle with my friends like it was I was removed from it and then I had to start all over and then being the new kid in the school um, perpetually was was damaging to to my for you know my the way that I thought the way that I was forming my my skills and the way I looked at other people and just being able to trust so you know um yes it did give me the ability to you know like right now as an adult like I don't know any strangers like I can walk into a room full of people that I don't know and just start you know talking and that's why I'm so good at what I do when I, you know, when I go up to share or, or do a speech or something, it, it comes so natural to me because I've already been exposed to that so many times growing up that, you know, I don't know a stranger. I don't, I don't have any fears of the unfamiliar. I kind of more or less have fears of things being too familiar, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but as far as um, being able to, um, you know, like most children, you know, go through these different developmental stages. I just kind of think that that I was kind of uh, behind on a lot of things 
but also a head in a lot of other senses. Yeah. So, um, and I know and I've seen you uh, participate in events before, so I know what you say is true. You're very good at public speaking and engaging with audiences. So it's, it's true. It's a compliment to you. Um, you know, looking back on your, you know, your experience as a child, your relationship with your parents and moving around a lot, as you've described it, kind of feeling pulled in different directions. Do you, <clears throat> do you feel that your childhood experience kind of shaped your pathway to incarceration in some way? Do you think, do you see like a direct connection between that or do you see this as kind of just separate aspects of your life, um, really? Honestly, like the incarceration aspect of it, because it, it almost seems like I had skated through most of my life without being, you know, getting into trouble. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't until I think I was 37 that I got my first arrest. So like, you know, for the, for the, for the majority of my life, you know, I didn't, I wasn't living in that pathway, but it also, I didn't have the coping skills that I should have had to, you know, overcome, you know, life on life's terms. When something happens, um, you know, we, we seek counseling or we talk to a friend or we do these, all these different things that normal people do where they go to their family members and they talk. I was always taught or raised, you know, you turn to your addictions, you know, drinking, drugs, partying and all that stuff that that's how we dealt with the stressors in our life and and I learned um hey, that has consequences mm -hmm. you know and I never I don't think I ever really was um consequences weren't really a thing in in my formative years because every time there was something coming I was taught that you run from consequence you know we changed locations we changed addresses we changed it was just change 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 so there was not a whole lot of facing the music when I was when I was uh, growing up. So you know, now uh, one of the one of the biggest things in my recovery is standing firm, facing the music, and then pushing through to see what's on the other side. And you know, now that I've been able to do that so many times, that I know that there are wonderful things on the other side of that. You know, it's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be fearful of, and you know, we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to resort to, you know, self-medication or things like that. You know, um, stand and face music always has beautiful consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're talking about, you know, standing and facing the music. And I, I want to, um, you know, think with you about kind of that, that idea of facing new challenges and experiences. And, and what comes to mind for me is, well, in part, um, your experience in higher education, right? And kind of taking the step into earning your degrees, because I know you have multiple. Um, but I want to start kind of just with you thinking back to the, the first day that you entered campus uh, uh, as a university student. Um, can you remember that day? And kind of what was that, what was that like for you? Well, I knew that, that when I went, that it was this thing that was so unattainable. And it was always something that I'd seen on TV. And it had a certain you know, stigma to it that it was always these, you know, upper middle class uh, kids that that went to college and it wasn't something that was supposed to be for people like me. Mm -hmm. And that um, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, fear that I wasn't going to do good, like I didn't belong. And not, not only did I have a criminal record and, you know, I'd been to jail, these people were going to judge me and they were going to figure out that I was a fraud and I was going through so many different ways of, I was going through major imposter syndrome and um, going through a lot of that and then once I did get into the classes and start turning in work and then getting recognized for the work that I was turning in and then I started to open up and talk about my story that the other students in the class were very receptive and very warm to my story they were almost infatuated by it and they wanted to know more and and the teachers were just uh you know it was almost as like i taught them as much as they taught me mm -hmm. and um one thing i did learn was you know here i was when i first went in thinking that i was uh inferior and i wasn't good enough to be there that it turned out that i was like smarter you know and all these things that i would had in my head of not being good enough, I was like, you know, 
you know, I'm way smarter than some of these kids in this class. Yeah. A lot of kids, there's a lot of people in these classes that really struggle with, with just the basics. And I was going in there with this overwhelming fear that I was, I was going to be the one struggling and it wasn't yeah. the case at all. Yeah. So. And is it, so that was, was that kind of like a gradual realization you had over the course of like your first semester, you kind of started to realize, mm-hmm. Hey, like, actually I can do this or, or was it like, was it like a pivotal moment or just kind of a gradual thing? It was a gradual yeah, it was a gradual thing, you know, and, and, and it was it's the different, the different classes that I was in that, you know, I was always struggling. And then like, as I, would you know, I'd turn in a paper and then receive my feedback and going, expecting a D or an F and then getting back A plus with all this commentary. I'm like, what? And then I look, I'm like, let me see your paper. And I take the person next to me, I'd read theirs. And I was going, you seriously turned this in? Like, I couldn't <laughs> believe like, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm not, it's really not that bad. So just being able to see the level that the people around me that I, that I felt like I couldn't compete with, it was just, you know what, maybe I, maybe I'm not as dumb as I thought I was, you know? Right, right. right. And, you know, it, it sounds like you had some good experiences with classmates, you know, people really valuing your story and and being interested in in your life and and valuing you as a person which is which is good to hear um I, you know I, I know you're you're a project rebound student um you're involved in the project rebound program at csu bakersfield um kind of what, what's been your involvement with that program and how how significant has project rebound been for you in terms of your success at, at csu bakersfield um i have so far like the the first thing that i did with Project Rebound, um, what was the first thing? I don't know if it was the first, first thing, but one of the most significant things that just completely, I mean, blew me away was the um, the workshop for the civic engagement and, and you know, um, political involvement. And that workshop, you know, it's always been, and this is, this is the thing is like, maybe about year, halfway through my first year when I was in school, I started to become a little bit of an activist, you know, and I started to become a voice for, for, you know, uh, formerly incarcerated students. And it started to be something I was really passionate about. And like, you know, um, I, I was interviewed um, by the local news here on recidivism rates. And like, I got really internally passionate about speaking out and speaking for our population. And, um, you know, um, I even went to county supervisors meetings and uh, spoke up about the AB 109 funding and how um, we needed that program because I, you know, I was like, hey, if you guys think that this program doesn't work, like this is, I'm, I'm here, I'm standing right here. Your guys' funding is going to good use. It's, it's doing, giving people like me an opportunity. Like, so like I would go and I started being, politically active on my own. And then when I got involved in, in that, it just opened a whole new avenue for me that I was like, oh, this can, this could go so much, so much deeper, you know, and, and um, it kind of taught us basically the ins and outs of how the system works and what it, what it entails. And Mm -hmm. um, that, I think it's just that one workshop right there, you know, made it seem like, you know, and of course paying attention to other political figures across the nation going, you know what, if they're doing it and they can barely tie their shoe, (laughs) (laughs) it's the same thing in school. It's like, I went in thinking that I didn't have a chance, but you know what, hey, if they're doing it, why can't I do it? Right, right. You know, and I would love more than anything than to to go and speak on the legislature, in front of legislature in Sacramento. That would be my passion. You know, I would love to be able to do that. And um, you know, put a face to the name and remove the stigma that, hey, you know what, there, there are people, you know, that are incarcerated that don't belong there. Mm-hmm. Yes, that they've done things wrong, but you know what, maybe if our system was different, that if it took more of a um, um, social work standpoint, that things would be different. Mm-hmm. You know, you're taking people, the, the criminals, yes, they need to be locked up, but the people that might need some social assistance, that people like me that came, you know, uh, from, you know, an addict home, 
people that came from, you know, alcoholism or homelessness. Like I, I mean, I spent the majority of my teen years with my mother homeless, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and sometimes we don't have any other choice, but to, you know, involve ourselves with the people that are surrounded. And, you know, when we live in poverty, you're surrounded by people that make bad choices. Right. So sometimes right. it's not always about what people, you know, what, what they're really, uh, who they really are. It's what are they forced to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what mm -hmm. choices do they have? So maybe if we could, you know, redo the system, um, I don't know that there are uh, very many people that would be incarcerated if they had a chance, you know? Right, right. No, that's a, that's a, that's a helpful point in framing. And, um, and I want to talk about that kind of you know, also including your experience of incarceration and how that has shaped the work you're doing now and, and your worldview. Um, but first of all, you mentioned you were first incarcerated at 37, is that correct? Yes. And where and for how long were you incarcerated? Um, just here, I did my, my, my prison. I had two prison sentences that um, due to overcrowding, I had to serve in county, which was horrible. So I did my prison terms here locally at the county jail, Lairdo, out there at Lairdo. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I served about six months in Kings County Jail. So I've been in and out, I've been in and out. Okay. But, but nothing like it, extensively. Okay. And you know, while you were in, in, while you were in prison, did you have access to any educate, were you, educational resources of any kind you were talking before about kind of this notion of thinking about rehabilitation and providing kind of more services to help people you know succeed and, and move past their circumstances as opposed to just locking them up and I'm wondering while you were in prison did you have any resources to help you do that or was it pretty barren it was almost like the first the when I first got locked up it was like totally unseen, totally unheard. Like, and when I got out, there was just like, they, they took you in a van, dropped you off in the worst neighborhood in Kern County and basically like say, see you later, you know, mm -hmm. um, fend for yourself. And there was no resources. They didn't care. And then like, as the, like, the next time I went that it, there was more like, okay, well, we're going to link you up to some services. And then that's, when things started to change. And I think that's about the time that they put the, the R in the CDCR where they were making it, you know, rehabilitation instead of just correction. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that, you know, while I was in there, they would let you do like Bible study. Mm -hmm. There was GED and a few, few classes, but it was the, the programs were so small that it was literally like the same 10 or 15 people that, you know, were allowed to go. Nobody else was allowed to go. And it was always the same, the same 10 or 15 people that were known as the goody goodies, you know? So it was almost like you were separating, okay, here you have these goody goodies. And then I guess the rest of us are all bad. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, the rest of us are all bad. Well, well, we'll, we'll never get to go anyway. So we might as well just be bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we just felt like we never had a, an opportunity or a chance, but then um, as the program started to roll out and they started to do things like the matrix and they started to, um, you know, allow, offer it to more people, it, it, it had a bigger impact. Next thing you know, everybody, the, 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 it was almost like it, it, it transposed. You had this huge group of goody goodies and only a very small select people that that wanted to be bad mm -hmm. and it was almost like those that were misbehaving it's like nobody really wanted to be that anymore when you offered education and all this these opportunities all of a sudden everybody wanted to do something different mm -hmm. you know and they they had gardening and you know um computers and all these things that, that people wanted to be you know a part of and you give them the opportunities, then all of a sudden people automatically wanted to, you know, start doing good Yeah. because they didn't want to miss that opportunity, but you make it so small, then give people no hope. 
Right. So it sounds like you're saying if you, if you kind of, your experience, if you offer the opportunities and make them more accessible, that yes. many, many of you, you know, the, the persons you knew and yourself, you felt like kind of would jump at those opportunities if they were there. And it was almost the, the, um, the wrong thing to do was to continue getting in trouble, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so when it was the majority of people at one point that was what we that was what everybody did because well nobody had the opportunity anyway and it just it flipped back the other direction to where you know if you want to continue acting like that then then you ain't a part of us that's that, that's mm -hmm. not even cool people are trying to get home to their kids it became it changed the, the culture completely mm -hmm. because it, it came it was more about doing something different you know mm -hmm. and then um you know there was two different sections one was they called it the farm where it was more outdoors and more it was like less restrictive kind of more free you know you could go outside and you know do all those things and it had a lot more opportunity and then there's pre-trial where you're you know you're locked in a pod 24 hours a day i think you get to get out like once or twice a week to go out to the the rec yard or whatever um education was really scarce there and you didn't really have a whole lot of opportunities to um, to do that, but I think as of as of lately, they 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 started to change that, mm -hmm. you know. And I and I had talked to the GED teacher because I I had already I graduated high school with honors, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But here I am telling them that I didn't have my high school diploma because I was so hungry for knowledge and to get out of that get out of that pod and to stimulate my mind it was it was i that's what i did i told them yeah. i needed my ged yeah and then you know they were letting me take packets back to the pod and i was like well you know what it's not just me but there's a lot of people in there that really want to do this stuff and he's like are you kidding i'm like no so i would take armfuls of worksheet packets back and pass and people were dying for it hmm interesting but they, there's like even if we don't even if we don't get to go yeah at least we could do this stuff you know and then we would all sit at a table people that were struggling with math or whatever i'd sit at the table and i'd help them you know we, we, we would teach each other but if if people were allowed to you know get their edu higher education like that like you know give them give them the material let them do it on their own i guarantee you um when, by the time they got out they could have a degree and i'm a firm believer that the the biggest uh the biggest weapon to recidivism is education yeah because if we have people that only think on a basal level and they're still thinking you know animalistically and, and on on survival then that's how they're going to behave but once you start to educate them they elevate and they start to think and then that critical thinking comes in and it just education changes people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you leave them in there to do nothing but time and program and, and sit there and watch Maury Povich all day. But I think if you allow them the opportunity um, to educate themselves, I think we would be correcting a huge problem. Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of great, you know, content in what you said there. And um, um, and just for clar clarification too, the, the programs that you're talking about or, and the, the packets and the, the different kind of educational resources you were finding creative ways to access, was that at Lairdo or was that yes. at a different facility? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And was that, was that experience um, pretty central in your choosing to go into higher education post-incarceration or did you already have that in mind? Like that was something you wanted to do? Well, once I once I started <laughs> that process in there, um... And I realized how how it made me feel inside. Then that's what I wanted. But then when I got out, I I went to um a like a halfway house or a program called Terra Lens. It's owned by Lynn Huckabee, the owner of Freedom House. And um, I had initially just got out thinking that I was going to get a job and then um, think about maybe going to school or you know just doing whatever I could. I knew I didn't want to get in trouble anymore i knew i wanted to be with my kids but he flat out seen something in me and he goes you know you're very different he's like i've never really seen anybody with as much determination you see I've, I've always been not just trying to help myself but i've always been the one that's reaching out trying to help everybody around me while i'm still struggling and he's like you know you're trying to help other people up while while you're trying to get it he's like 
what I want you to do. So is if I sponsor you, will you go to college? Mm-hmm. And I was like, you're asking me if you sponsor me, if I, are you crazy? Of course. That's all I've ever, all I've ever mm-hmm. wanted in life is for somebody to provide me with the stability to be able to not worry about where I live, what I'm going to eat, you know, or, or if I'm going to have to move because that's been my whole life. Every time I've ever gotten focused in school, it's time to move. So if you're offering me stability, I would like, watch what I do with it. You know, and, and when he did, he, he, he gave me, um, he bought the house next door to his program, told me if I ran that house and stayed there, then all I have to worry about is school. And, and that's what I did. Not only that, did I get one degree? I got five. Wow. And, and where, yeah. where, did you, did you, where did you get those degrees, those, those five degrees? Um, the five degrees um, at Bakersfield College. Okay. Okay. And so, but most of them, well, all of them, they all like one class crosses in, into all diff- different disciplines, mm-hmm. you know, and one of them is liberal arts, liberal arts and a monkey could get a liberal arts degree. So, <laughs> you know, mine, mine are communication, sociology, uh, psychology, human services and liberal arts. So like okay. all those go into, you know, pretty much go in one of one ball, you throw one ball, they bounce into all five different disciplines. So got you. And, and you were at BC Bakersfield College for a few years before coming yeah, to CSUB? Three and a half, four years. Okay. All right. Great. And then you transferred over to CSU Bakersfield. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, in terms of, you know, in your path to higher education, it sounds like you had this powerful relationship, this person who kind of believed in you and helped support you. And that was really pivotal, uh, mm-hmm. which you know, just sounds like a wonderful um, a person to have in your corner. So I'm very happy that you had that that support. Yes. Um, you know, what what would you? I mean, did you face challenges kind of in your path to higher education? You know, whether you talked about imposter syndrome and kind of having to get over that. You know, that was something that you had to learn about yourself and realize the talents you had, and then you were able to kind of move past some of the significant aspects of imposter syndrome. Were there other obstacles you faced, whether kind of social or financial, that you had to that you had to overcome on, on your path? Well, I know that my first my first semester at CSUB um, was a oh my gosh, that was a horrible challenge because um, I had dr- landed my dream job. So not only what did I break all barriers, but I was working at Wasco State Prison, which I should have never been allowed to work there being a felon being you know doing what i did um i got the warden to sign off on my paperwork as a substance abuse counselor so i worked on a yard and m yard um in their sap program Mm -hmm. uh i was working out there and then i was also working at a transitional house for for people that graduate the um because lynn had opened up another he opened up another home that was specifically for people that were transitioning that didn't need the supervision anymore that basically they were able to come and go on their own they were working going to school that just basically needed that stability yeah and um accountability but they didn't need to be constantly watched because they they could be trusted not to go get loaded or you know what i'm saying yeah yeah so it was basically like a golden girl's house for girls that were, you know, working, going to school and things like that. And I was kind of overseeing that while going to working there and then um, going to school full-time at CSUB and the basement flooded. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> so here I am working full-time, had a full load of, at school and then the basement flooded. My laptop was ruined. Like it was just a nightmare. And so I had to withdraw from that semester because there was, there was no coming back from that. Yeah. So I did have to um, withdraw from that semester. And then maybe I think I took the next semester off just because it was just mentally draining. Yeah. It was just so much. And, and I have a really hard time with self-care. Like I do, I can do 10 things at once and it doesn't bother me, but like, if I don't stop, take the time to do for me, then, you know, I'll get burnout. So I took that next semester off. And then after that, that 
that's when I started going um, back full time. And then I realized, okay, I have this class and this class that I need to get this degree. And, you know, so basically my last semester in junior college, I was going to Taft College, BC. And then um, I was also taking my substance abuse uh, classes at the Christian Institute. So I was taking classes to, you know, do those requirements all over. And then once I got all that done, then I transferred to CSUB. Okay. So basically it's just, you know, I, you just can't ever depict or, or predict when, when, when something like that happens, it's just, you know, you know, it just, things like that just happen. Yeah. Right. I mean, these, cha these unexpected challenges that arise yeah. and, you know, I mean, the, the, like you said, you can't control for life things that are going to happen. Right. Um, but if you were, you know, if you were put in a position to, to think, um, constructively with others, and maybe you already are, already are doing this, actually, I, I'm not sure, but if you were asked about ways to help facilitate the path from incarceration to higher education for other persons like you, like what, what do you think would be important steps for a university to take uh, uh, to, to help try and ease that transition or make it, you know, um, uh, more possible for formerly incarcerated persons to, to gain access to uh, CSU campuses and higher education. Are there things you think that we could do better to, to help that along? Um, I do believe, you know, I think it's more of a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one of the things that, that maybe not now, but that's something that's on my goal list that I, I've been kind of already looking into and seeing what needs to be done, but I want to buy an apartment complex mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, in that general location of the school that I want, you know, people that are long-term offenders or lifers that are getting out of prison that really don't have any patience for, you know, dumb stuff that really are not interested in substance abuse and, and returning to crime that really genuinely want to change their life. Mm -hmm. I want to, I would like to be able to have that because that's the gap that's really missing is, is stable housing. Mm -hmm. and, and housing that that will allow them um, the safety uh, of of being able to reintegrate because there's you know but without being overbearing because a lot of places you know that a lot of long-term offenders are going to um, have so many rules like you are on a blackout and you can't do this and you can't go here and you can't do that and it's like you know what how is this person supposed to return to normalcy if they're not allowed to go get their identification and things like that. So I think just basically, if they could find some kind of housing that will protect them from, you know, outside, because a lot of this, this moves a, 10 times faster than I know that they're used to. So kind of, you know, psychologically or aesthetically soothing, mm -hmm. safe, but that will allow them maybe, you know, go, go get those right to work documents. Um, help them learn how to use a computer, teach them about cell phones um, and do it slowly, but then get them to uh, get them through the process of, of um, filling out the applications of going to school and getting them through that process. Because man, a lot of them were coming, coming from a world that, you know, and m most of them, I know like my boyfriend, he was down 28 years. Mm, okay and and it's a lot to process like yeah they don't, they, a lot of places take for granted that sometimes the last time these people were out free there wasn't cell phones right right you know and so sometimes we might need to you know explain things a little bit differently and, and help them you know acclimate and then of course um guidance counseling mm -hmm. like how are they feeling because a lot of this is overwhelming to them right but, you know if if they could get them while they're still incarcerated to a certain level academically that once they get out here you know to the university where where you know maybe it'll be a smooth transition mm -hmm. i think that that i think honestly that should be part of the exit plan when when people are getting close to the gate that that maybe they should you know say hey what are your plans and and putting that as part of instead of just kicking them out and saying see you later that maybe that's you know something that they should be if they want to go to school get the application process started in there 
get that dialogue started and and you know have some sort of a have a person that's designated on their caseload and that you know will follow through if they go home to a family member make contact and say okay wh where are you at what do you need you know because i think it can start in there i think that it could be it could be coordinated a lot better than it is because i, I think that's where we lose a lot of people is base basically it's just fear right because it's so overwhelming right and if we had kind of yeah maybe some of these you know, housing, support services, helping with the transition, maybe to, to touch on a previous point of yours, maybe that could help push back against some of the yeah. recidiv recidivism rates that we see too. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, instead of this influx of, of people just being pushed out into the street, given absolutely no resources and, and no other choice other than, you know, doing things that, that they don't want to do. Why don't, why don't we, you know, turn around and, and in four years, give them back a, a bunch of, you know, pre-med students and pre-law or, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. give them the option of doing what, what they want instead of what they have to. Right. Cause I right. guarantee you there's a large, large percentage of them that don't want to return to prison that don't want to go back to being a criminal that don't, they don't want nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Dina, um, are there, they're kind of, attributes or skill sets that you think you possess and, and maybe um, peers and, and friends you've known uh, who have also been incarcerated that you think you bring to higher education um, because of your experience in being incarcerated and the, and the life the life experiences you've had um, that, that come to mind for you that you feel like, well, these are actually assets I have because of these experiences Yes. That now I bring it. And if so, like, what, what are those skills or and attributes? It, and that's one of the things that, that when I when we were talking about when I first started going to school and how I felt inferior because of, because that's the stuff that I was told, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But then when, when you start getting around the other people and you're looking at their, their people skills and, and, and they're just so um, benign to everything around them. And it's just like, okay. But then you realize that that gave me, that gave me a leg up because not only the things that I did in my criminality, it, it gave me uh, the ability to read people, read situations, to be able to communicate without saying a word. Like we just, we, we read the room without speaking, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's things that we pay attention to on a, on a much deeper level that people are very, um, they're unaware of, you know, and then just being able to anticipate things that, that go over most people's heads. So that's interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, that's not, that's not something I've, when I've asked this question before, um, I, I hadn't heard that response before. A lot of people talk about grit and resilience, which seem very true, including in your case as well, but also the ability to kind of like a social perception and, and see things others don't see is an interesting insight. And, emo, and um, um, I always talk, that's one of the things when I was a counselor at, at, at the prison, I would never, never stick to the curriculum because most of it was talking at them but i would i would i would incorporate other things and one of the things i always taught them about was emotional intelligence mm -hmm. you know that 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 carries you much further than iq so we can book learn all we want but if we're not emotionally intelligent then it doesn't carry much and i think that emotional intelligence has a lot to do with it and being able to be mature enough to read other people you know, and a lot of times people that, that have been incarcerated for a long time have that emotional intelligence and then they have the ability to not have to be the center of attention because a lot of people, they, they think, um, you know, if I'm out here and I'm doing this and I'm, you know, seeking all this attention and doing all this stuff right out front and center, that that's going to get me noticed. But most people that have been incarcerated for a long period of time know that that's about sitting back, paying attention to everything around you observing collecting information and then making your moves got it got it yeah. interesting so dina you know we've been talking about um higher education and kind of numerous uh, uh ways here both kind of your access to it while incarcerated your experience at bakersfield college and now csub and um, obviously you've been very committed to education and the degrees you've gotten and and the success you're having now um you know, but what to you is the kind of the value of education? Why do you think it's so important to pursue uh, education? 
you know, you can, you can put anybody in therapy, you can put them in any 12 step program, um, after care, you can do a lot of things to, you know, and a lot of times I, I, I'm a firm believer that a lot of these programs that are, that are grant funded or state funded, um, use incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people to get the funding, hmm. you know, and I don't see a lot of the funding used to help the formerly incarcerated people, mm-hmm. right? So you can put these people in all these programs all you want, but until you educate them that self-esteem, the self-worth, the efficacy, the, you know, there's so many things that go into it. Education is the only thing that you can put somebody in that you can never be taken away. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can rip up a certificate, you know, or once they graduate, it's not going to mean anything. But education is the only thing that I believe that will keep people from reoffending. You know, it's 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 boundless. The gifts are boundless with education. And I've been doing this even even as a student. I would I would bring all my flyers because I was one of the founding members of Photo, which is a group at Bakersfield College called Free on the Outside. Yeah. I was one of the founding members of that. And I would take my little pamphlets and a, and a little, and my laptop and go to these little um, halfway houses and, uh, you know, substance abuse treatment centers. And I'd go and I'd ask for time. Can I meet with your students? Can I talk to them? And I was just a, a sophomore or freshman at Bakersfield College running around to these places on my own volition, signing people up, give my little presentation and signing people up for school. Yeah. Because I was so passionate about, hey, you guys really want to stop doing what you're doing? This is right. the way. Right. And that's such important work. And I, I, and I am familiar with Free on the Outside. I know I've, I've, kind of, I've collaborated on a few events over the years, and it's a wonderful student-led organization, I know. Um, you know, with, with, your, with your experience here at, at CSUB, and I know it sounds like at BC that Free on the Outside was an important network for you, and you were doing some really positive work and helping give educational access to others through that work. Is there a, a pretty solidified community amongst Project Rebound students at CSUB? Or, you know, how does that, do you connect often? Are there, uh, does it feel like there's a community there for you? At, at CSUB? Yeah. <sighs> I don't think C, at CSUB it's the same as it is at other CSUs. Uh-huh. Something's missing. Hmm. That, and I, I'm not sure if that has to do with, um, the pandemic yeah or if it has something to do with other but it's 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 um but even even before when when i was in in it back um it, it's almost like there was there's a missing element like there's a lot of you know this is what we are this is what we do and then when when it comes time for that to be shown it's never shown hmm. like i feel like there's a big element missing with the project rebound here that they're doing in other other places okay so there could be some more yeah com- community building efforts or actually kind yeah. of following through on some aspects in that regard yeah okay, interesting um are there suggestions you'd have for that like in terms of you know something if you were in charge of project rebound something you would do if i was in charge of project rebound i would definitely have um you know I know a lot of the people that, that I know that are in Project Rebound, one of the things that they're having an issue with is when they're having questions and they have concerns or they have, you know, I don't know, then, and then, well, that's what, that's what they're supposed to be. You know, you're supposed to go and have, I just honestly think that there's needs to be um, a place where you can answer or get questions answered. Cause okay. a lot of people are having an issue getting a straight answer. Uh-huh. You know, and, and then, um, you know, going, uh, going to somebody for, for something and then never getting back to them and then thinking, you know, Hey, they're working on it, but then they never, they're, then you, Oh, I didn't do that. Or I didn't, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, so somebody, you know, I have a friend of mine who, who missed out on the whole, um, fall semester financial aid uh-huh. because they thought that, somebody was working on something for that and then they never got back to him. So I just, I don't know if it's just uh, too much on somebody's plate or, or what's going on, but you know, I just think that maybe there needs to be uh, a centralized place where, where if people have questions that they can go to and then, you know, either be 
routed to somebody that can help them so that that, that doesn't happen. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's helpful and sounds important too. Yeah, having to follow through and a clear place to get answers like that. Yeah. Um, transitioning a bit here, I mean, I wanted to ask you, you know, if you could, uh, you've talked about a lot of aspects of your life today and, you know, kind of your childhood, your experience with incarceration, education, some of the social activist work you've been doing. Um, if you kind of go back to talk to your younger self, you know, before, you know, as, when you were a child, are there, are there things you'd want to tell that person now about, about your life or things they should know or things you'd want them to know? Oh, I would tell them, absolutely. You are definitely smart enough to become a physicist and work at CERN. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my dream job. I yeah. always thought I was never smart enough to even go anywhere near that. But I mean, just stay in school. Like I, I honestly, for some reason growing up, I always thought that college was for, for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like I never felt like that that was something that I could obtain, you know, and that was the biggest lie. That's the biggest single number one biggest lie that I was fed growing up was that it was for somebody else. Yeah. So that's well said, right? So give yourself some encouragement and yeah. reassurance that you are good and smart enough. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, it's fantastic, Dina. And I think that's an important message for a lot of us. Um, you know, are, are there are there things that you know I, I didn't ask about today that that you think are are important to to tell as part of your story and and things you'd like to chat about? Mm, I don't know. Did you get a chance to look at those news links? I did. So I saw. Yeah. yeah that, that that so that's, you know for for the context of this interview too. So Dina had sent me some um, some news articles, both about some rehabilitation services programs that she was in, but also her. Uh, incarceration and arrest, and um, uh, those were helpful context. Uh, but Dina, did you want to share some details on kind of what your, you know, what led to your arrest and or your rehabilitation uh, program that you were in? Um, just honestly, like I was lost. I didn't, uh, I kind of didn't feel like um, I ever was able to get recognition my whole entire life for for doing the right thing. So um, I was kind of thrust out you know, and left with no choice. I was homeless and, and, and um, didn't really have any other options. So I started to get in trouble. And then next thing you know, I'm getting recognized for getting in trouble. And I'm a very resourceful and, and, and determined individual. And, um, you know, if I can apply that, you know, into a positive, which is what I've been doing, you know, I, I was able to make it really far and do a lot um, you know, in that lifestyle in a relatively uh, small amount of time. Mm -hmm. And, and I just felt like, you know, that was the only place that was willing to receive me, mm -hmm. you know, because here I was trying to do all these things and getting door slammed in my face and, you know, um, trying to overcome challenges being, you know, living in poverty and things like that. So I just did what was natural and, and, and started to get recognition where I could. And then, um, you know, I wound up getting arrested with, you know, an AR-15 <laughs> mm -hmm. and 500 rounds of ammunition. It was just, that was just part of the, the thing, you know, the lifestyle I was living. And um, my saving grace was the fact that, you know, I had two kids that were young mm -hmm. and that if I had went to prison for that, I, by the time I got out, they wouldn't even know who I was. Mm -hmm. So I, I took a, a, a plead with them you know, because I'd never been given an opportunity to work on my substance abuse um, issue, that if I got treated for my substance abuse issue and had no um, violations, that, you know, would they be willing to do that? So that's what they did is they said, hey, you know, we'll give you a year and then a year in a program. And, but if you violate one time, you're going to do the full seven years in prison. And so I took that, like, I will do that. And that's exactly what I did. And it's the, the day I got out, I didn't waste not one second. Um, I didn't, you know, lay in my bed and um, look for ways to, you know, sneak around and do things I wasn't supposed to be doing. I, from the day I got out, I got pen to paper and I started dealing with the things inside that, that, that made me sick. Mm -hmm. I started to, you know, work the 12 steps. I, I, I followed any and every suggestion that somebody that was successful in my life had 
given to me because, you know, they say, if you model after somebody that, that you look up to, you can be like them, you know, and, and that, you know, one of the things was, is to change your daily routine. They say successful people do daily what unsuccessful people do occasionally. Mm -hmm. So I made it a daily, daily habit to get up every morning and, and, and have some sort of structured routine to where I, I fed my mind, my body, my spirit, um, I educated myself, <clears throat> had, you know, did my daily, <clears throat> my daily prayers. And I made it my life. My life's work has, has been about rehabilitation, about um, helping others, trying to figure out what, what, what is wrong with this, with this, this problem and, and, and seeing if I can't help other people get out, you know, and I'm like, I might not have figured out the way out yet, you know, of this, this maze, but I've tried to take as many people with me along the way as I can, you know, and um, that's that my whole life's work and will continue even after I get my degree is to continue doing what I'm doing. And that's making sure that, that people like myself or, 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 you know, people that are, are coming out of prison or out of poverty, that they have access to education and that the only thing that stands in somebody's way of a different life is their willingness. Mm -hmm. That as long as somebody is willing, that the opportunities will always be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I think that's really well said and, and really powerful too, a powerful message for this interview and, and what you've demonstrated in your own life. Uh, and it sounds like in a family, spirituality, education, those have kind of been some really central pillars for you. Yes. In terms of moving forward and, and setting your standards on where you wanted to go for where you had been. Yeah. 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 You know, and I don't know, everybody's got, you know, a different spiritual beliefs, but my, my, my fundamental belief is, is that, um, you know, even if we lose hope in ourselves, there's always something whether it's you know you're you know whoever or whatever your higher power is you have to trust and believe that no matter what your situation is right now that things always get really really hard just before you turn the corner mm -hmm. you know your higher power um whoever it may be you know isn't going to leave you in a bad situation but sometimes a lot of really negative things happen to us right before we um turn a corner and mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, not just being a formerly incarcerated individual, but also um, having worked in, in re-entry and, and that for so many years, I have witnessed so many people so close to a lot of really good blessings give up just before the miracle happens. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I always tell people, stay put and, and, and power through it because you don't know what's on the other side. Right. Yes. Thank you for that message as well. Um, so, Deanna, this has been a really uh, wonderful conversation. And um, again, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and your, your insight and, and these messages too, these really kind of constructive messages for us to, to listen to today. Um, so this, this interview will be, as I mentioned, included in our Orchestra collection on the Humanities Beyond Bars website. And I'll, I'll send that to you once, the, once we get done editing and, and the transcription and put that up on the site. So you can take a look and access that and, and share as you see fit as well. Okay. Thank you so much again. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be, I'll be staying in touch. Thank you. Okay. Take care, Dina. You too. Bye-bye. Okay.